Uh, thanks for coming down. Uh, it's been a pretty neat conference so far. Um, it's a little intimidating for me because uh, as far as C++ programming goes, I'm probably the least uh, uh, of the people in this room, I'm probably the, the lowest in, in, in C++. I actually started C++ back in 1996 um, with an interest in game programming, but it was, it was as a hobby, and it wasn't until 2006 that I started, uh, I made my first web application, and I actually chose to wrote it in C++, and uh, it was basically, um, you know, I would take a MySQL result set, convert it to XML, and use XSLT, and transform it on the, the server side, and used AJX to serve the HTML um, over the wire. And this was like pre-jQuery web application. Um, and after that, you know, I became a professional programmer and it was all PHP and jQuery because that's where the, or not jQuery, but JavaScript. Uh, that's where the demand was at. And uh, I've made tons of web applications using PHP, Node.js, and JavaScript since then. And none of them were as long-lived or as stable as the very first one I wrote in C++. Uh, and uh, so when I, I finally got fed up with web application programming the way it was, I decided I wanted to make it a little easier to do. And ironically, C++ is the tool to do that, <laughs> as complicated as it is or as big of a language as it is. Um, uh, if I didn't say it, already say it, my name is Jason. Uh, um, so this is a talk, it's mainly going to be about MATA programming, uh, the type of MATA programming that you would do with the library Boost HANA. Uh, this library depends on Boost HANA uh, and it uses it quite a bit. Um, and the focus of the talk is this library, a network-based data layer, it's called Nibdl. Uh, it's used for managing state and the idea is it's, it's going to be able to do that seamlessly over the, net, the network. Um, does anybody do any kind of web or JavaScript? Programming. Have, have you heard of React JS? So this is meant to be uh, to uh, be a replacement for React JS or Angular JS or one of those. But it's it's more than just that because it's not just web applications. It's 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 anything. So like React JS or even Elm, um, they only solve the client, the web client specifically because it's uh, it's JavaScript. And they don't handle, uh, even React.js doesn't even have a, a means of handling the state, although they do have like libraries for that called Redux. Um, this is meant to do that um, using C++ and its type system. And the cool thing about it is it's, it's platform, cross-platform, so you can do it on, on uh, like a tvOS or, uh, or even Android or, or any device um, that you can target with C++. So just a quick overview of, of the talk. Uh, I'll go over the purpose of Nibdl and, and um, how it works. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll discuss some um, basic abstraction stuff and how you can use Boost HANA, uh, some of its core functions for uh, uh, facilitating that. Um, and then I'll go over the concepts in Nibdl. And one in particular is a store. Uh, it's used for managing state. Um, it's actually, uh, I believe it's co-state. And, and forgive me, I'm not a math person. I'll probably make some of the people in here cringe. But uh, um, it's a way of uh, keeping uh, state deterministic and so that you, the user can't molest it in, in a way that would cause uh, unintended effects. And then uh, <clears throat> there's some uh, tools in Nibdl for, for promises. But promises are used typically for programming with values that are in an asynchronous context, but they can also be used for meta programming with values in a, in a runtime context. Um, and then after that, I'll show uh, you an empty interface that I believe that can be used by programmers who don't want to have to worry about things like object ownership or the potential for undefined behavior, uh, but they can, they can use that interface in C++ without having to worry about that kind of stuff. And then if there's time at the end, I'd like to show you some Docker stuff. Um, but uh, I don't have many slides on that. All right. So can you guys 
tell what this is doing? Is it, is it readable or is it intuitive? Or can anybody tell me what, what, the, what they think it's doing? Yeah, so it's, it's basically a, uh, this is the empty interface, so it's basically defining your, uh, so in web applications or any kind of user interface, I believe that the, the, the document structure is, is known statically. So like even though there's things that change based off of runtime values, you, you at least know all the branches at compile time. So what this does is it creates like a specification that's used to, uh, to transform into a series of functions that renders uh, DOM elements. And it can um, update them automatically based off of changes in state. So what this is is like this match function here um, is actually matching on a variant in the, in the, uh, the store. And uh, in this case, I had the variant was a, uh, all its types were integral constants with the, the total number being the number of slides. And it actually, uh, it ended up generating a lot of code. And on this little MacBook Air, it would take about 24 minutes and eventually run out of memory and crash the compiler. <laughs> so, uh, so variants are really nice, but they can get, they can get me into trouble at least. So I wouldn't recommend doing it this way. But at the time when I had written this, the only the only tool for um, looking at state that I had was matching on a variant. So that's what I had at first. But I had to fix that obviously because it wouldn't compile on this little laptop. <clears throat> All right, so Nibdol, it manages state, uh, and it handles the communication of changes in state, and it can do so uh, in a way that you can connect instances of different instances of Nibdol to each other so that they can all uh, maintain the same state. So like you can see two client devices would see the same thing. And it's, it's basically the idea like in React.js, you have different uh, user interfaces that would reflect changes in state, but this, this works across devices and it should handle it seamlessly. Um, and also I provide like implementations for common use cases like uh, web sockets or rendering HTML. Um, I have a, a pretty good start on UI kit um, for uh, like iPhone and, and I plan on uh, supporting Android as well. And maybe eventually uh, even I am GUI, I believe would be pretty easy to integrate. Uh, so this is the simple diagram of how it's laid out. So there's the, uh, the producer layer, the store, and the consumer. The store is meant to be where your state is, and it should receive actions, or I call them messages, and it should be deterministic and blocking operations on that. But with the, the producer and the consumer, it's non-blocking. Um, so this is where like uh, I.O. happens. So like your producer could wrap a persistence layer or it could wrap a anything that would represent that. So like a client connection. So it could be a WebSocket client that connects to another instance of Nimdle that then wraps the persistence layer. And uh, they send messages to, e to each other. And uh, so there's upstream messages and there's downstream messages and it's, it's a, a one directional flow. And the consumer uh, could be something like uh, some uh, uh, a rendering of state, so like a HTML or uh, whatever, or it could be a client, or a, I'm sorry, a server that um, has many clients, and it would be distributing messages to all the clients on a in an application that works over the network. Any any questions about this? Is it pretty clear? It's pretty simple. Um, oh, that's weird. So this is, uh, in Nibdol, there's a way, there's a, uh, an interface for being able to define the context of an application. Um, so I can set up producers using these definitions similar to that HTML interface. Um, and I define access points. So here I have this access point called the current slide, which is like, it represents the current slide, like right here. You can see that we're on current slide number five. 
and then I, I specify a payload and a store um, and a path, which, which is basically a, a key that is used to access that specific element in, in the, the overall store. Uh, and here's another access point that does not have a store, but it is used to be able to create messages for like, uh, so like this store can listen to messages from this to see if it should change its state based on whether or not I clicked left or right, basically. So it, uh, it has the action of, uh, or it has, it has a variant called slide action, which has previous slide or next slide, basically. Um, and then the consumer is a, the only consumer here is just the keyboard. It's listening to the keyboard to see if I'm, I'm pressing left or right. So uh, the way I set Nibdl up, it wasn't, not originally, but when I learned, I started learning uh, Boost HANA, I was looking at its internals and I liked the way that it was organized. And uh, some of its core functions are, are really useful for making customization points and just organizing code in general. So I'd like to show you some of the internals of that. Um, <clears throat> so HANA has concepts um, that are implemented kind of like traits. So here's the monad concept. And all it is is it's a trait that returns an integral constant bool that uh, specifies, that it takes a type and it has to, the type has to have a non-default implementation of either the flatten or the chain function. Um, <clears throat> so it can be used to, to constrain functions. Um, and here's the, the, imp the default implementation of flatten. So as you see, it, it actually um, is derived from this default class. So that's how it, it, it checks to see if it's the default implementation or not. And it has this uh, static apply function, which actually just calls chain with the, the, uh, the identity, as you would expect. Um, so if you implement a chain, then, then flat, you'd have flatten like for free. And <clears throat> so here's the, the actual user facing flatten function. And what it does is it uses this tag of function to get a, a way of identifying a specific data type without having to know its like entire um, representation. So like for a tuple, uh, its tag is just a tuple tag and it's just an empty struct. And, uh, and so here it uses, or it, it gets the implementation of flatten for that specific data type using uh, template specialization and then asserts that it's a monad. And then, it, you know, here it just calls it. Is that pretty simple? Easy to understand. So here's the, the <clears throat> use of the tag of function. Um, so you have a tuple of int, char, and double, and its tag is just tuple tag. So for any tuple, the tag is always going to be tuple tag. Um, and one thing about that I noticed, and I'm not sure if it was intended or not. I think it was. but So for this flattened impl, the m is the tag. And I noticed that the symbols, if it wasn't using the tag, the symbols of this would be a lot larger because uh, the representation of this function would, would include all the, the, the type for that right there. Is that, is that part of like a compile time performance thing? Um, so especially in like debug mode, um, it can affect your compile time if, if it actually had a really large uh, template parameter there. So I actually uh, <clears throat> turned this, this tag of function thing on its head. And instead of having a tag for all tuples, I made my own template uh, specialization thing similar to the tag of, I called it spec of. And it gives you a tag back for a very specific implementation of a tuple. So if you have like this really large tuple, like for instance, that, that context definition or the HTML definition, uh, when I pass it to like uh, the, 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 spec the, the thing that flattens the specification, I didn't want to have to give it a huge template parameter. I just give it the tag and then inside that, 
it it uh, it it then you know gets the representation from the uh, the spec of, and and that's how it. So the functions that actually get used don't have this huge template parameter; it just has a tag. So that that actually speeds up. Well, one it speeds up the the debug compiling, and it, and it kind of speeds up. Uh, um, you know, um, release optimization compiling, and also it makes the error messages a lot reader, so you don't have this function with this huge template parameter in it. It's just a tag. And uh, the cool thing about the tag of um, made a function um, is that it returns the identity for for uh, structs that don't actually have uh, a spe specialization, um, like like for tuple has its specialized for tuple tag, but for my own struct, it's just the identity, it's just my struct, which is very useful. And here's just a, an example of an implementation of you know, my own list, and it just has my list tag right there. All right, so the, the Nibdal concepts, um, they're implemented in the same way that HANA concepts are, although they're not probably they're probably not like mathematically correct, but uh, they 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 do effectively constrain like kind of like Rust traits do. But um, so the producer concept has two functions: the make producer. So inside the nibdl context object, it has to create the the producer in it, and it has to give it a handle to itself so that it can push messages. So um, I had to give it a factory function so that the uh, user can, can you know, basically create a type with that, that unknown context type. And then send upstream message is just a way to send the producer a message. And it has to be up, uh, an upstream message, which is checked at compile time. So here's a really simple echo producer. It just echoes, it receives uh, the upstream messages, and it just converts them to downstream messages. Um, uh, with that HANA tag, if you don't specialize the tag of, uh, you can also just simply have an alias called HANA tag in your class, and that works too. And that, that's convenient sometimes. So this just has a, a handle of the context. Um, and the implementation of make producer, as I said, it just takes a context handle and it creates an echo producer. So it's pretty simple. Um, and the implementation for send upstream message. Uh, so the thing with creating an object is for a key, you might not, especially if it has a runtime state, you might not know what, or you won't know what the key is until after it's persisted. So when you create a message it, uh, and you send it upstream, um, the, the producer has a responsibility of making a key, and in this case, it just has a static integral that uh, increments every time. So it's useful for testing and, and basic stuff. Yeah. Is there any reason for making the function transpect first? Since I, I assume you could have, have you know, be manipulating runtime state, and you, you will probably never actually use that in your context expression, will you? Uh, yeah, you're probably right. I'm kind of in the habit of just putting context per in front of everything, but uh, <laughs> it's probably unnecessary. I, I wonder, does it? Require the compiler to make extra checks. Would that be a performance issue? You think? If you don't put context first. Yeah. Uh, no. I don't think so. All right. Uh, just to repeat the question is why did I put context uh, uh on the function? And the answer is basically yeah, it's unnecessary. <laughs> um, yeah. So that right here, it's actually pushing the message. So it has the handle of the context, and it just pushes it. Um, Pushes it downstream. So there is runtime stuff going on here, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, consumer, same thing. It has a make consumer and a send downstream message instead. And it also has a notify state change um, for consumers that only want to know like when a certain value at a certain path changes. Or it, it could just uh, ignore the path and just do something on any change. Um, so pushing messages, oh yeah, and another thing about make consumer is that the handle to the context that it has is also, uh, it implements the store concept so that it, it can actually look into the store and, and do stuff with the values like render. 
Um, so pushing messages, this is like the keyboard consumer. So when somebody pushes the right arrow button, um, what it does here is that the path, because it, it can't have runtime state because we wouldn't know what the key is, it's actually just lifted it as the type. And then I have this facility for creating an upstream message uh, so that, so the thing with the context is that it, it actually creates a variant for messages. So, and, and it can be difficult to, to create the correct type so that it actually has factory functions for that here. Does that make sense? So the path is like the action that you're going to do, right? The path? Yeah. No, the, the, well, it, it kind of describes the location of the object in the store. So kind of like a, a, a way of creating a lens, sort of. Okay. And then the action is, um, in this case, is upstream create. So it's a make upstream create message. So that information's in the, in the message object. So like payload, for example, can you give it an example of what a payload is, for example? What would a payload? Uh, in this case, it's a, a uh, slide action next. So slide action next is an object that is, it's actually just an empty tag, but it's a member of a variant. Um, and the, that variant in the store has two possible states, slide action next and slide action pre previous. So you can send it one of those and it'll just uh, send that as the payload. Um, so this is kind of hairy. It's the notify state change for that same keyboard thing, but all it does is it just console logs the, the state, and this is when I had it as a variant. And, and nibdl variants, empty type is called unresolved because it's meant to uh, represent values in the state, in the store that might not be loaded over the network yet. So it has to have some kind of state, and so in that case it would be unresolved. And then any other case it was a integral constant, and I was console logging that there. Does that make sense? <laughs> Any questions about that? So you end up generating, if you have, if you have like uh, 10 slides, for example, you end up generating 10 of these, 10 of these, uh, you instantiate 10 of these over the parent for the, for the, okay, so we have like a variant with 10 different things in it? In fact, it was 56. So the question is, is am, I, am I visiting every possible member of the variant in this notification call, right? Yes. Yes, the visitation happens here in the match function. Okay. Um, so yes. So it, it generates a console log for every variant. So yeah, I, I do currently have a, a code bloat problem with that. And that's why I'm not using the variant anymore, mainly because of the compile time. But I, yeah, I definitely see a case, especially in the rendering part, for some kind of type erasure thing. So, yeah, I definitely thought about that. <laughs> All right, uh, so this is the entity concept. I could probably throw this away and use HANA struct. That's all it really is. Um, I've never, like, compared them like the, a benchmark or anything. I might say that entity is a little lighter weight than HANA struct. Um, and uh, if I was to implement this as a foldable, which I don't think I do, I think I would just unpack the, the members of the struct instead of pairs. I th struct unpacks as pairs? Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it has the macro nibdl entity, which is very much like HANA adapt struct, or boost HANA adapt struct. So here's how it would look. So there's a struct person T and a struct user T. And uh, I should probably hurry up a little bit. So it's, it's just like kind of adapt struct. Um, and you give it the, you know, the, the struct and then the members and the sequence matters. Um, and I, I think the sequence is guaranteed in HANA struct as well, right? I, I read that in the documentation that, oh, well, it's not a HANA sequence, but it is sequential though, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, the HANA accessors function says that it's, you know, a sequence of, or, you know, 
a, se a sequential list of accessors. So I, I think I might actually end up using that. Uh, but that's what I wanted. Um, so this is uh, the concepts bindable sequence and bindable map, uh, which have the functions bind sequence and bind map. The names might not be that, that great. It, it, I could also probably call it visitable sequence and visitable map. Um, and the reason I'm not just using uh, HANA iterable in the case of the sequence is that um, I wanted to support pair and optional, which aren't necessarily iterable. So um, <clears throat> it's basically just like a, a sequence of visitable objects and map has um, an interesting constraint in that the keys have to be HANA strings. Um, so this is actually useful for um, serialization, but also what I want to do, uh, eventually at least, is make a way of adapting a data structure to a newer version of that data structure or even a subset. So like let's say there's a, um, a piece of information that has some sensitive information like a social security number that we don't want a certain type of client to see. Um, we can just bind it to that new uh, data structure that doesn't have that sensitive information and we can do that seamlessly with this uh, visitor pattern basically. Um, oh, and also, uh, so for bindable sequence, we could bind, or we could serialize to a, like a sequential binary format, but if we changed our API for like, let's say it was a, a microservice and we changed the API, we could, um, one, use a, like, let's say at compile time, I somehow generated a checksum of a given type, I could use that as part of the handshake, uh, so when they connect, they could see which API version of the API they're using, and it, it could convert it to the appropriate data structure. And we could use bind map to adapt, or at least help adapt, uh, the type. Uh, let's say if the order of the sequence changed, or if one of the the, the data types changed, um, without without a lot of um, complication on the user part. So here's, here's an example of, uh, so this is just a tuple of a bunch of types. And I'm using a bind, what I call a binder. It's kind of like a visitor. And in this case, it's nibdle binder JSON CPP and it, two string. And it converts all of these into uh, a string, basically, a JSON. Uh, so person and user are the nibdle entity. It supports tuples. It supports HANA maps with keys that are strings. And here's just this little empty type. Oh yeah, and it supports any empty type. Um, so in, in the, the, the Nibdle example pipes, it uses these as messages. So it, it, it generates a variant from this tuple and then it sends each of these as a message across the network. And when it finds the terminate tag, it closes the connection. And here's what it looks like as JSON. So this is what it would look like being transferred over the network. Does that look right? Anything fishy about it? The tuple has only five elements. Yeah. So the, um, the comment was that the tuple only has five elements. It says this is a tuple with six elements last. Uh, the reason it only has five is that if you look at the in C++, where is it? There's a compile time string. So you see I'm a compile time string, underscore S. So it, it doesn't, there's no need to, to represent that across the network because that's, that's uh, embedded in the program. So it just, it's just deleted out. Uh, with the exception of uh, HANA optional, if it's empty, it, it's represented as null. So bindable variant basically does the same thing for variant-like types. Um, so here we have a variant with uh, two empty types, an int and a string, and I convert, I just make a tuple to show you every representation, and I convert it to a string, and this is what it looks like in JSON. So for the empty types, it doesn't bother representing as array, it just shows the number of its position in the variant set of types.
Does that make sense? And the cool thing is, is this is what I use for dispatching messages. And uh, I'm sure you guys have been doing this stuff with variants for a while now, I, I've noticed. But it was mind-blowing me, to me to see how you can dispatch with just a, an integer and not like a regex expression. Uh, so store. Store is, uh, is actually your state, but in a context that you can't get to. And there's a reason for that, a couple reasons for that. Um, first of all, you don't want people um, molesting the state um, without it going through the system that should not only be deterministic, but it should send, uh, it should be able to send those messages to other clients and, and know about it. But you, you have, to, so that has to be regulated inside the store. Um, also, you might not know the values representation in the store until runtime. So uh, it has this match function and apply action. Uh, I won't be showing apply action. It's kind of a, I only recently realized that store could be um, implemented for many different data types. It was originally just something that was quite specifically a store. So uh, I still need to clean up apply action for that. So HANA map can be a store. Um, and, and it's pretty simple. So uh, a, the way that you can access a value in a store is by giving it a key. So it's kind of like HANA searchable in that instead of calling at key and it returning a value, you actually visit it kind of like a variant. Um, so the match function takes a store, then the key, and then it has a function that it uses for, for visiting it. Does that make sense? All right. What happens if the key is not in the store? And if the key is what? It's not in the store. Uh, so if the key is not in a store, it is a compile time error. Uh, so entity is a store. Uh, same thing, only the keys for entity can either be a compile time string or there's also a macro for representing the pointer to member. But I like the compile time strings. They're a lot easier to work with. Uh, so the question is, what is the 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 argument of the lambda? Yeah. Uh, so the argument is of type std string. Um, so this person object, uh, it's actually just taking right here. It's a string literal, but the the actual representation is an std string. So we're basically just visiting this like a variant, but we know that it'll always be a string. So I just specified it right there. It's a member of the structure, so, and that's going to print John, right? Yeah. That so the comment at the at the bottom shows that it's going to um, the the output is John. Yes. So yeah, yes, you can use auto. Uh, the question was, can you use auto in the lambda? And yes, it's just like variant visitation. Um, so yeah, it, it matches, and you can use auto. And you can even give it an overloaded function for visiting. Uh, HANA sequence as a store. Uh, it's basically the same thing, only it's there's a slight twist. So HANA searchable on sequence is a little. Um, I don't know, I don't, I don't think it's very useful because you have to give it its identity and it has to have the, the same, well, it doesn't have to have the same runtime state, or does it? No, it doesn't. Uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll ask you later because I'm, I'm not. So basically, you, there's no way to get a, an element in a HANA sequence by a, its type, is what I'm saying. So with HANA at key on a tuple, you have to, you basically just give it as its identity. So the, the function is basically just like saying, does it have this value or not? Um, so this kind of adds to it. It, it. it lets you use its type, its HANA type representation of it. So it's just, uh, but there is the catch that you have to visit it as a store. So <laughs> it's not as useful as something like std get. Um, any questions about this? All right, so a variant as a store, this is the obvious one. So it's, 
it's like variant visitation. Uh, so, but the difference between like just vanilla variant visitation is that we're passing in a key and that value in the variant has to have a key or ha has to have that key. Although if it doesn't, uh, it will still call the lambda with whatever it finds. So if it was an ob optional, in this case nibdl optional has the empty type of nib nibdl nothing. And uh, that's what would be called in, in the lambda. But in this case, it's John. And the nibdl match function also supports uh, not taking a key. So it, the, the implementation of match could also have an overload that doesn't have a key. And so in that case, this is just like vanilla variant visitation in that it just returns the identity of the variant. Yes? Uh, so nibdl optional is actually just an alias for variant. Okay. Uh, so yeah, sorry, the question was, um, I'm saying that it's a variant, but I'm just using an optional, but it actually is a variant. But to me, a, a, an optional is just a variant of two possible states. Sure. Which, one of which is empty. Yeah, one of which is empty. Okay. And in this case, it's nibdl nothing. But it's literally just an alias <laughs> with a different empty type. All right, so match path. Uh, could someone take a guess what a path is in this context? That would probably be a member of a store. So that's what we called it before. Uh, so the comment was, "Is member of a store?" No, that it actually points to a member of a store. Um, so, so far we've been using keys, so a path is actually just a HANA sequence of keys. So this gives us the ability to look deeply into a, or look into a deeply nested structure of store objects, basically. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so in this case we have this account, and sorry I didn't show you the representation of account, but the first the first uh, member is a username um, of type string, and then a person T with a tuple called name right here. And then uh, that tuple has a, na a type name first and name last, which you can look up by the type here. So here we have this path, which is just a tuple of keys, person name and HANA type name last. And then, and then the match path function, you can actually give a, a variadic amount of callback similar to uh, Vittorio's uh, overloaded uh, visitation. And in this case, it's the, na the last name, Rice. So does that, that make sense? So it's like a, a way basically of programmatically building up a path to in, inside a struct. So you can say like, who's that bar that, that, that does? And you're going to do that by saying basically, fetch. Uh, the two compiling string, comma, the bar compiling string, comma, the bad compiling string, and then you say, you know, resolve that path in that, in that structure essentially, and it goes down to that, right? So, so the comment was, you can make a path called foobar.baz, and it goes down in that structure. The answer is yes. Okay. That's neat. It is neat. <laughs> it's basically building up a bunch of nested match. Yes. So is it building up a bunch of nested match? And yes, it, match path is, there's no way to actually uh, implement a customization for this. It just uses match recursively. And the cool thing is, is when it gets to the end of the path, it can use that identity. So if you wanted to get a, a, um, the value inside of a variant that's at the end of the path, it just gives you the value that's inside the variant. And maybe I'll show you that in the ne next slide. So I got five minutes. I really need to start hurrying up. I was figuring I was going to be done really early. If it fails in the middle of the path, it propagates the, the nothing that's all the way down, right? Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the question is, is if it, I'm so, If it fails, like if there's nothing but in the middle of the path, then it is propagated all the way down, like monadic error handling. You're going to get a compiler error. So is it like monadic error handling? I'm confused by the, the auto refresh nothing. So I guess 
So th th this could actually just be nibdle nothing. I didn't have to use auto, but I did. Um, but yes, if one of those were nothing and there were still elements to match on the yeah, path, yeah. there would be a compile time error. Oh. And that's, a, that's actually a problem that uh, I'll show you how I get around that in a few minutes. All right. Promises. This is how we get around it. So as I said before, promises are useful for programming in with values in an asynchronous context or meta programming with values in a runtime context. So like uh, if you wanted to extract a value out of a, an asynchronous context, you would, you would block and you would wait for it, right? Well, how would you do that with runtime? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> Unless you wanted to wait till runtime to, uh, to figure it out, but you can't do that. All right, so I kind of went for full blown nerd factor and I made a common interface for asynchronous promises and synchronous promises, but it gets kind of ugly because of that. But uh, there are some, some payoffs at least. So run sync, this is runtime promises here. So here's a path promise. So if you had, if you had that, that nothing in a deep path where you're expecting something, it would be a compile time error, but we can use a, prom a promise so we can look partway into that and then require that at a certain point in that path, it's a specific type. So as you see with require type, and, uh, and then, oh man. So I actually changed some, hold on a sec, 40. Well, if, if you guys didn't notice, this web application is written in C++ using Nibdl. I guess I forgot to say that. <laughs> um, all right, so yeah, this is less confusing. So, so run sync takes any kind of a promise, but it can also be a sequence of promises, which then it, it chains in an event, but with sync, it's, it's kind of obvious that it would be sequential anyways, because it's blocking. But so here, yeah, we have a, um, we require that the type at this be name last t, and then I can also just give it vanilla functions, and that implicitly do, just does a transform on the value at that point in the, uh, in the chain. And then I also have a tab function for side effects. And then this catch function is interesting in that if this require type um, rejected wasn't of name, if it wasn't the, if the type wasn't a name last, it would reject the value and it would skip everything until it found a catch, and then it does something like error handling. And as you can see, it it, it prints out McGee with uh, it as uppercase. So does that make sense? We got like one minute left. All right, so this is what it would be if it was rejected, it would print something else. And this is the implementation of that require type. It's just nibdle promise that takes a function that has a resolver. And uh, as you saw in that other promise implementation, it had like a fulfill and, and reject. This is just one parameter. And I found that that has a tendency to generate a little less code, but it has the member functions resolve and reject. And uh, if it's not of the type you're expecting, it rejects it. Does that make sense? All right, so here's an, uh, so HANA index if, uh, if you're on the cutting edge development branch of HANA, there's an index if function. And like all of the HANA functions that take a predicate, they're required to, the predicates are required to return a um, integral constant convertible to bool. Uh, so the, that's a problem sometimes when you want your predicate to return a runtime bool. And in this case, so like you can't just use HANA for each, and, and uh, find a value that matches a, a, a runtime predicate because it's going to visit every single value in the sequence. So this, this, does, this solves that uh, with an eager implementation using this promise interface. And what it does is it transforms this list of, uh, so this is like a, a, an empty list of predicates. It converts it into a tuple 
uh, and it default constructs them and converts them into this predicate promise wrapper. Uh, and uh, if it gets to this point, well, so also, okay, so this is a tuple and it'll run each of those predicates sequentially. And if um, it resolves them all, it'll actually fail. So I kind of flipped the reject and resolve here. It's uh, inverted. So if it's actually resolved, it'll reach the static assert and fail. So, and it's just using dependent like size of args over 9,000. 9, so it should never get to that point. Um, so you have to have a predicate that returns a compile time logical true. Uh, and that would be your otherwise case or your default case. Um, so if it, it does find a predicate that returns true, it'll, res it'll catch it and then it resolves it. So this is actually nested inside another promise. So does that make sense? All right. Run, run async. So this also supports asynchronous promises. And the cool thing here is that there's no reference counted pointers or ownership. So uh, run async will, will um, basically squash the promise object down to a single object and allocate it on the stack. And when, it's, when it gets to the end, it deletes itself. So you don't have to worry about ownership. Here's a uh, simple server client. Um, and I'm a little over my time. Is that okay? Uh, should I wrap it up or? All right. So um, here's the uh, a simple serv uh, ASIO server. So it uh, so here's a server that has a, it accepts a single connection and then it just prints whether it connected or had an error. Um, and then uh, for the client, same thing. It connects and then click. Um, it, it connects like I think it's like ten times, and, it, and if it fails, it gets to this example attempts. So it, it rejects it with the example attempts, and I, I can do something with that. Otherwise, it's a, an ASIO error code at the end. No shared pointer. <coughs> we'll skip that one. Uh, the cool thing about this pattern is that unhandled rejections are handled at compile time. So the empty UI, uh, I kind of showed you this at the beginning. So here's a, I believe there's a, a we can provide interfaces in C++ to users who don't want to worry about object ownership or undefined behavior, um, people like JavaScript programmers. And, and this is the way to get there using this empty object or tag or whatever we call it. Uh, does anybody get the dingbat reference? Um, so here's an example of the bulleted slide. It's basically, uh, it just takes, the cool thing about it is you don't have to worry about references. Uh, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, like perfect forwarding or whatever. You can just copy it by, by uh, value because it's empty. Uh, and so here we just have a header and then it renders a, an arbitrary amount of bullets inside an unearned list. Um, it also allows you to match values in stores. I showed you guys this earlier. Oh yeah, but this isn't a variant. So like I have an optional string here and it can print out. Uh, so here we have our store and in this case it would print. Nothing, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and my solution for the, the variant visitation on 50 slides, I got rid of the variant and I just made it a, a value I can do, I can compare on uh, constant. And uh, so in this interface, you have to either, you have to give the functions either a constant, a HANA constant, a HANA string, or a path to a value in a store. In this case, this is a, a list of predicates and I'll print out one of those values. So it's just like reveal JS. I kind of copied their CSS, or not copied it, but. Um, and just a quick thing on Docker. So here's the, for this, this project, here's how I'm managing the dependencies. I just, and because they're all header-only libraries in this case, I just uh, copy the include directories and then I remove the original source. And the, the cool thing is that I can do this, I, I want to make, the vision for this is I want to make a way of generating these files. And I actually made it to where I can actually do this for cross-compiling. 
Um, and I, I, I think that we could probably do package management in all uh, and build all of our libraries in a Docker context and then cross compile for different platforms like Windows or iOS or Android or uh, for the servers and whatnot. But uh, that's all I have time for, to show you for in Docker today. <laughs> <laughs> Special thanks to Louis for making Boost on I. <laughs>